I am Sweet Pea Bicycles, and I design and build custom bikes for women. And this is a job that didn't exist um, because bikes were bikes, and everybody would walk into a bike store, and it was either this one or that one, and the guy would say, you know, okay, it looks like you can stand over this one and reach the brakes on that one, which color do you want? And what I noticed early on was that there were not very many options for bikes that fit women, as well as men could expect bikes to fit them. So I got started um, building bikes with um, a very useful liberal arts education and a history of bike messengering. Not very useful for what I was about to embark on because the job that I needed to do was one that required tools and lots of them. Um, my first day hooking up my welding tank, I needed to make a call to my sweetheart to say, okay, if I don't call you back in 20 minutes, come over because I've blown myself up. Um, so I knew that I was a little in over my head, but I had a real problem that I wanted to solve, which was figuring out how to get women on bikes that fit them beautifully. And so little by little, I had to learn how to use um, a lathe and a mill and uh, welding torches and um, and eventually fitting tools and this wacky little device called an XY coordinate. And I came to really love and appreciate the tools that I had around me. Um, but I also came to see some of their limitations. And so what I wanted to talk to you guys about today was um, the three lessons that I've learned um, in three short stories um, from struggling with my tools. Um, and this doesn't involve um, any kind of pyrotechnics, but starts, in fact, with um, a tool that I call the Asomatic. And part of what I do, and probably the most important part of what I do, is help women determine what position they need to be on on the bike. And most women who have ridden bikes will tell you that the saddle <coughs> comfort is one of the biggest keys to being happy on a bike. And one very smart bike company came up with a tool. They don't call it the asthmatic, they call it something else. But basically it's a tool that you sit on and it's got this gel thing and it's got this little ruler. It's got all the items that would make you think that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the impression your butt leaves on this tool and the saddles that they have on the shelf. Um, you know, they've got millimeters on there and millimeters can be very convincing. But tools, and this is the lesson I learned, tools can oftentimes mislead you into believing that they can tell you things that they cannot possibly tell you. Um, so, and they can also um, kind of distract you from the conversation you really need to be having. Um, it's a great way to talk about sits bones. Sure, you sit on this thing, it tells you the width, and you say, then you need this width of saddle. It means that the guy in the bike store doesn't have to talk to you about soft tissue. And that's a big benefit to him. Um, but is it going to help you sit on a saddle better? Probably not, because there's a lot of physiology and there's a lot of bike position that goes into what makes a bike seat comfortable. So I learned early on that this was um, a good starting point. But if you didn't use this tool, understanding its limitations, it was essentially like having a saddle Ouija board pointing you to something on the wall. Um, so story number two is rebuilding the jig. Uh, one of the most fun things that I get to do um, is actually cut tubes, put them together in the angles and lengths that make a bike that corresponds to your body alone. And to do this, I use a manufacturing jig specially designed for building bicycle frames. Um, you look at it and it kind of looks robotic. Um, it looks um, really clunky, it is really clunky. Um, it's uh, probably 50 pounds of adjustable aluminum. And um, it has indexed on it all of these kind of measurements where you can set the head tube angle and the seat tube angle and you can set the front center distance and all these other things that make you feel like, excellent, this builds a bike. You put tubes in here and out it comes. Um, Though the first encounter with the jig will tell you that's not really true. But after many, many encounters, you think, okay, I understand this tool. I have a relationship with it. And I know that eh, actually the front center distance, it's fudged a little bit on this. And I know I need to set it two millimeters shorter. And then I'm going to get the right result. But the day that I realized I had to build a bike 
that was smaller than what this jig could accommodate was the day that I realized that this tool embodied a wisdom and a working method that was limited. And I needed to actually, you know, figure out which parts of this I could dismantle, um, rearrange things, and put it back together in a way that was never intended by the person who built it. The person who built a bunch of these really special, very clever jigs, but never had accounted for the possibility that a bike could exist that was going to be smaller than this tool. Um, so that was a um, slightly challenging um, build, but ultimately I ended up with a bike that certainly would never have existed on the floor of a bike shop um, and became a vehicle for this woman um, that she's ridden, I think, 20,000 miles on um, to date and um, made me feel that understanding the embodied wisdom is only good to the extent that you can then adapt it with your learned experience. Um, and then the third story I want to tell you is about my grandfather. And he was not a mechanic all of his life and grew up in the Great Depression. And he was incredibly resourceful, brilliant mechanical mind. And you know, I'd bring to him things like my shop radio, um, ghetto blaster really. It was made in the 80s and, and it wasn't meant to be fixed. It wasn't meant to be taken apart. But he looked at it and said, okay, I'm going to need to make a tool make a tool to get into this box. And um, he was, you know, once he did, he was had some questions to me about what music it was that actually got stuck in there. And he wasn't really sure that, you know, maybe that perhaps was a contributing factor to my boom box <laughs> decided to give up the ghost. But the fact that he made a tool left a really big impression on me. And I realized I'd seen that over and over and over again, that it wasn't that, he looked at a set of tools and said, okay, what can I do with these? It was more, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? And without romanticizing, you know, the straws with, you know, a bit of wire and a part from the vacuum cleaner, like he would put things together to get the job done. And so he probably never thought um, during his whole career as an auto mechanic that he'd end up having a granddaughter that he could talk shop with. And I never imagined that what I ended up doing would be something that we would be able to engage in at a really kind of fine level of detail. Um, but he asked me how things were going in the shop, a normal over you know, dinner conversation. And I said, well, you know, I'm really struggling with how to get this specific braze on onto this part of the bike. It's, you know, there's no way to really measure it accurately and then holding it's kind of a son of a gun because it's a really small piece in an area that I don't want a lot of heat. And I felt that certainly this was, he doesn't braze, he, he doesn't know bikes and why this cable stop needed to be 105 millimeters away from the dropout, none of that. But he had a language of tools and of making things. And this was the lesson I learned, that that is a common language, that when we make things, we have something to share. And that evening, he was able to share his whole encyclopedic knowledge of clamps and things that I'd never encountered before and ways that he had used them. And, you know, in talking about this, we realized that there were eight solutions where I had seen maybe half of a solution. And so, um, sharing, sharing the knowledge and having the courage to assume that your problems and what you're trying to solve is understandable by somebody who does something with other tools um, is really powerful um, because we can get persuaded when we look at tools that they do a certain thing, um, but really tools are kind of a living embodiment of, of our knowledge of, um, of how to make things um, and our best used in conversation with each other and with the problems specifically that we're trying to solve. Um, so I think I'm gonna be wrapping up here a little bit early, um, but this is what I wanted to share with you. So thank you.